My soul finds rest in God alone. Salvation comes from Him. My hope is found in God alone, and we will trust in Him. In God we trust. In God we trust. And my song, a fortress found in God alone, for you, O Lord, are strong. In God we trust, in God we trust, in God we trust, in God we trust. Teaching we have heard By His guidance we are growing Daily in His Word My soul finds rest in God alone Salvation comes from Him My hope is found in God alone And we will trust in Him in God we trust, in God we trust, in God we trust, in God we trust. Peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin.
Good morning and welcome to our worship here at the Chula Vista Church of Christ. We are so glad that you have joined us here today. We pray that this worship service will be a blessing to you. We know that each one of you joining us today is a blessing to all of us who have come together online to worship the one true God. Let's begin our worship service this morning with our first song, I Stand in Awe of You. So if you feel like standing up and singing along at home while you're singing, please do so. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard, no can grasp your infinite wisdom, no can fathom. Majesty enthroned above, and I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due. next song this morning, Here I Am to Worship. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for our sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it costs to see upon the cross I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross Here I am to worship Here I am to bow down 
Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. What a beautiful song, and I hope that it expresses what's in your heart this morning, that you are indeed here to worship. Before we go on in our worship, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this day. We're thankful that you woke, up, woke us up this morning, opened our eyes, put breath in our lungs. Father, we are so blessed to be a part of your creation and a special part of your creation at that, made in your image. Father, your children whom you love. Father, you show that love to us in so many ways. Father, none greater than the gifts that you've given us in your Holy Spirit and the gift of your Son, Jesus. Father, we pray that as we continue together in worship this morning, that the songs that we sing, the words that we speak, the communion that we share, the prayers that we offer, that all of this comes up to you as an acceptable sacrifice of praise. Father, we are so grateful to be your children. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We'll sing this next song to prepare our hearts and minds for partaking of the Lord's Supper. Ten thousand angels. He bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, Crucify him, he's to blame. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died
communion talk today focuses on the sacredness of the Lord's Supper. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-25, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, he sang, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do in remembrance of me. And when you drink of it, you will, you will proclaim my death. Do in remembrance of me. This institution is not a casual act given by Jesus. Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, commands us to observe this ordinance. He is also here delving into the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Notice this was given the same night in which Christ was betrayed. There was no time for anything except what was most significant. Christ knew from the time he entered this world the purpose for which he was here. Now coming to the close of his ministry, he begins to speak to his disciples about the crucial hour that is at hand. It was a mystery, even to his followers. They tried to put a temporal meaning on everything he said, but all the while he was seeking to prepare them for the hour when he would fulfill his redemptive mission. Men had tried to do away with him more than once before this time, but he always escaped. However, when he was taken to Golgotha's hill, he did not resist, because he knew his time had come. It was according to God's divine design as revealed in his word. When Jesus came to that moment, he was a sheep led dumb before his shearers. He opened not his mouth. Jesus taught, I lay down my life for you. Jesus refused to die in any way except according to God's eternal design. These last days of Jesus' life on earth tell us that God has orderly, orderly patterns and that he has patterns and that his patterns do matter. God's pattern for the church matters. When it comes to adhering to scriptural doctrines and principles, there must be no variation. We must study God's plan in his word and then follow it. To partake of the Lord's Supper without our minds being closed from the outside world violates its purpose. To eat the bread irreverently without recognizing, remembering anew what it really means violates its sacred principle. There's nothing cheap about our salvation. One of the reasons the Lord ordained this supper is that each time we partake, we are to relive in memory the sacred cost involving our redemption. It is, ser it is a serious thing to make unsacred that which God has decreed to be sacred. By violating sacred things, we bring upon our lives the judgment of God. It happened more than once in the Old Testament. On one occasion, Saul was impatient at Gilgal for the man of God to come and offer sacrifice. He rushed and offered it, not waiting for the priest, and brought a curse upon himself. On another occasion, the Philistines took the ark of God out of its proper place misused its intended purpose by carrying it into another camp. And because they misused and dishonored that which was sacred, they brought a curse upon themselves. God help us to never defile his word by mishandling it. It is the stream of his revelation. We can never allow any false doctrine or erroneous teaching to pollute it. Jesus said, This do in remembrance of me. Much of God's word is designed to remind us that our whole spiritual being revolves around a sacrifice that brings redemption for our sins. Our security is not imitating Christ, it is partaking of him. Ephesians 5.30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Note the words, his body, his flesh, his bones. We are members of his body. The church, people, people of all ages and nationalities form his body under its head, Jesus Christ. The church is his body on earth. We are his hands, his feet, his mouth, and his ears. You and I are his body functioning here on earth today. Christ's flesh that brought our redemption was sinless flesh. His spirit was eternal. He is the Son of God. He is God. He housed that eternal spirit for God in a body of flesh. If Jesus had violated any of God's laws, it would have disqualified his human body from being the perfect sacrifice for our sins. However, he lived in the flesh here on earth without sin for over 30 years. 
Therefore he could offer his flesh as sacrifice for our salvation. We are partakers of his flesh, in that we, the living flesh, can live in righteousness through our Lord Jesus Christ by God's grace. Our communion with one another is so close that when one suffers, everyone suffers. When one member rejoices, every other member should rejoice as well. The Lord's Supper should not be taken in solitude. Communion speaks of the reason we are intact. We are one body, one member joined with one member joined with each member. We are one body. And why are we one body? Because Jesus Christ gave his life, shed his blood to make it so. Let's pray. Father God, as we partake of this bread that represents your son's broken body, we thank you, Father, for we thank you for him. We thank you for all you do for us. And, and may we may we be mindful of who we are and what we are and who we represent here on earth. May we be mindful of what your son did for us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we know it represents your son's blood shed on that cross. We thank you, Lord, for, for loving us so much that you came to earth, that you found us worthy enough to be saved. Help us to be mindful and remember just who we are, what we are, and again, who we represent here today on this earth. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. at this time I'll give thanks for all tithes and offerings. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for being our God, for being our Father, for loving us and blessing us. Thank you for all we have. Thank you for this very country. Even though we're in turmoil now, we, we know that as your children, we can look to you for guidance. Help us to be the guiding light here on this earth. Lord, as we take up these tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless them. Help those that have to make the decisions, fill them with your spirit and help them make the right decisions to glorify you. And as we could see in this church building today, that, that definitely is going on. It's it's an amazing thing to walk into your church here and to see the the things that are changing for the better and we hope that it continues Lord and we hope that we do everything to glorify you it's in your son's name we pray amen we'll now sing this song before our lesson today God of Wonders Lord of all creation of what an earth and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy, holy The universe declares your name you are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the love. 
experienced this either as a parent or as an observer, perhaps in a grocery store or Walmart or Target or somewhere, where you go into the store and there's a child who's having an absolute meltdown. Right? They're, they're having an absolute meltdown because something's not going their way and you see them kicking and screaming and you see the parents are, uh, you know, bless their hearts, they're, they're doing their best to, to try and keep things under control and people staring at them. It's, it's no fun to be in a situation where where someone's kicking and screaming and fighting and yelling and, and crying because it's just, it's an awkward situation. And it's, it's one of the things that we see happening in Mark as Jesus is beginning to exert himself as the Son of God, as the Chosen One, as the Messiah, because as we mentioned last week, he's not checking off all the boxes that they had hoped the Messiah would check off, and which led them to believe that he was not the Messiah, that he was acting to be, and that others were even claiming him to be. And we're going to look at a story of, of the Pharisees, the, the chief priests, and the scribes, as they are doing a bit of kicking and screaming themselves. And as I was reading through it and studying, it reminded me a little bit of King Saul. And of course, the comparison of, of Jesus over and against King Saul is within the New Testament. You remember the story where Jesus is confronted and because he's doing things, he's rubbing grains on the Sabbath and the, the Pharisees come to him and they say, why are you doing what is unlawful? And he says to them, do you not know the scriptures in the story where, where David is on the run from King Saul and he eats the bread that is for the priests? And in, in, in that story, Jesus is comparing himself to David. In other words, he is in that story claiming to be the son of David who was being chased by an old power, King Saul, who was on his way out. And King Saul is an interesting character. He, he starts off really well. And actually throughout his entire life, he seems to constantly want to be in search of the will of God for his life. He obviously gets it way wrong. I mean, the same priests that gave David the bread that I just talked about, King Saul had all of those priests killed. So he is definitely an old power that is kicking and screaming and fighting against this new move of God because Saul wants to retain his power. Saul wants to retain what was given to him, and yet Saul had neglected the purpose of what was given to him by God, and therefore he lost 
the power, and we, we will see that in a little bit. We have such a story in the Gospel of Mark with the life of Jesus. And so Jesus, in this story, he tells a parable. Mark has very few actual teachings of Jesus, and the few that are there, most of them are parables. So we're going to look at this one parable in the Gospel of Mark. It's Mark chapter 12. It says, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. Now remember again the setting. Jesus may or may not be still in the temple courts. Chances are he probably is, and he's, he's, he's turned over the tables. He's cast out the money changers. And now we find Jesus again with presumably crowds around him as he is teaching them. And now he begins to teach in parables. You can almost picture it as he's, he's teaching the people. And in the back of the crowd, he sees the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees standing there waiting. And so he begins to tell this parable. And it's, it's not a fun parable. If, if you've been told that parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings, this is not that kind of parable. This is an earthly story with a very kingdom of God on earth meaning. Let's take a look at it. Jesus tells this parable, he says, A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. This entire section, this, this vineyard and the things in and surrounding the vineyard, this is representative of Israel and the temple and the sacrifices. I, don't, I won't get into it now if you want to find out exactly how I come to these conclusions. Shoot me a text message or an email and a, or a Facebook message and let me know. It's, there's a lot of Old Testament scripture that support that the vineyard is Israel. God is the man and Israel is the vineyard that he plants. So it says a man planted this vineyard. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place, which was very common to do in ancient Israel. This was a common practice. A landowner had a lot of land. He would lease it to someone who would grow crops, and then part of those crops would go to the landowner to pay for the use of the land. So he rents out the vineyard so some farmers can, can work the land. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. So he just, this is common practice. He rents a vineyard out. He expects to be paid. It's harvest time. The man is fully expecting for that fig tree to produce figs. This is, this is the time he's supposed to get paid what he is due. But they, being the people that were, had leased the land and were working the land, they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. This is not how it's supposed to work. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. Now you know where this story is going. You know where it's going. They're not going to respect the son. They didn't respect the servants that were sent. They're not going to respect the son because in actuality, they had come to believe, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but they have come to believe that the land that they are leasing, they're not actually leasing it. It's theirs. And Jesus in this parable reminds them that everything is God's. But now that they are, the man is sending his son, he's sending the heir. He's sending the person to whom the land actually belongs in hopes that they will respect his son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. That phrase, come, let us kill him. That's the exact phrase that the brothers of Joseph used in the book of Genesis as they saw their brother coming and they said, come, let us kill him. 
because Joseph had all these dreams of power and rule and reigning, and they did not like that their brother had these visions, these, these, these dreams, these aspirations. And they said, come, let us kill him. But they actually didn't kill Joseph. Let's keep reading. Let's see what happens to this son of the man who'd planted a vineyard. They said, let us kill him so the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? So Jesus is done telling the parable and he's asking the question of the people who are listening. What is the owner of this vineyard going to do? They've just killed all of his servants. All of the people he sent, they've killed them and they've killed his son. What do you think the owner of the vineyard is going to do to these tenants? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. You can see why this this story reminds me of King Saul, where King Saul was selected and he was anointed by God and he was the one chosen by God to lead the people of Israel as their first king. And yet he lost his purpose and he lost his way. And so the kingdom was given to another. Jesus says, what do you think this man is going to do to those tenants? You think he's going to say, oh, well, I guess I'll just give it to them. No, no, no. He's going to come in and he's going to be just with them. He's going to kill them and give the vineyard to someone else. Jesus continues, he says, haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus says, haven't you read what's going to happen? There is going to come a time when the one sent by God will be rejected by the people of God. But he is God's chosen. And of course, in a roundabout, actually not so roundabout way, Jesus is saying that God is the one that planted Israel. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. And you've you've not believed them and you've beat them. And some of them you have killed. And now he is sending me his son. And you're plotting to kill me. What do you think God is going to do with you? He says you are fulfilling prophecy within your actions. It says in verse 12, Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. Yeah, you think? But they were afraid of the crowds. So they left him and went away. You see, this is, it's it's one of those parables where it's not hard to understand. Mark says that Jesus taught in parables so that the people would not understand. But this is one of those parables that was meant to be understood. It wasn't meant, at least as Mark gives it to us, it wasn't meant to be thought about. It wasn't meant to to be contemplated and try and allegorize it. No, this was a parable that was really, really easy to understand. Jesus is telling them that God planted vineyards, the vineyard of Israel, for a purpose. That purpose is not coming to take place within the way it's being expressed during the day of Jesus. And therefore, God is going to give that purpose, give that kingdom to someone else. Not because the people of Israel were disobedient, but because the leaders. This is, this is a parable against the leaders of Jesus' day who did not understand God, who did not understand Scripture. And therefore, they were unable to lead the people of God. They were a figless fig tree. 
But as I read this story, it, it reminds me a little bit of the book of Romans where, where Paul's dealing with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And he says the Gentile Christians, maybe, maybe they're getting a little arrogant. Maybe they're getting a little, a little full of themselves because they have kind of rose into power within Rome. Uh, you, this is a little bit of Bible nerdy, geeky stuff, but uh, Emperor Claudius had, had actually expelled all the, the Jews from Rome including Jewish Christians. And it was basically Gentile Christians running the show. And then five years later when he died, the new emperor let them come back. And there was this power struggle between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And Paul warns the Gentile Christians, he says, look, if God has been pruning his tree and, and grafting you into this tree and allowing us to grow together, not in competition, but growing together as part of the same tree, what do you think God will do if you get too arrogant? If he was willing to cut off Israel, will he not be willing to cut you off? And as I read this story, it reminds me of that. It reminds me that when we lose our purpose, we lose our power. When we lose what it is we're supposed to be doing, we lose the power that God gives us to do that purpose. And we can go out kicking and screaming, as the first slide said, or we can humbly accept the fact that we have lost our way. We have lost our purpose, and we can be intent on fulfilling the purpose of God in our lives. And you might wonder, well, what is that purpose? What is that thing that we're supposed to be doing just a few verses down in the Gospel of Mark? And we don't have it here because... I preach on this so much, I, I, I don't want to do it again, but it needs to be brought up again because it's in the context. A man comes to Jesus and he says, what are the greatest commands? And we keep reading, we find out the greatest commands are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus hears the man answer that, he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're right here. You see, the church and the church, we run the risk of losing our purpose. And when we lose our purpose, we lose our power. If God was willing to take his vineyard, and give it to someone else because the original people he had chosen had lost their way. Do we not think that God could and would do the same thing again? He has done it before. And so it is my encouragement as I read the story. I hope you're as, you are as challenged by it as I am. Because as I read the story, in some ways it's a little bit frightening. Because I believe the churches, some of us, have become so arrogant that we've lost our way. We have forgotten that our goal is to love God and love others. And this parable speaks to us and reminds us That we have been chosen for a purpose. Jesus was chosen for a purpose. He was chosen at his baptism for a purpose. Or at least the declaration is made there. He was chosen and shown again in the transfiguration. And here Jesus is showing yet again. That these people, they're so dedicated to their understandings and to what they think God should do that they can't see what God is actually doing. Jesus says, you should have been able to see it. Haven't you read the scripture? He says, you should have been able to see it, but you can't. You've lost your way. You've lost your purpose. You've lost your power. And as my encouragement to you, and to myself, Don't lose your way. Your purpose is to love 
God with everything you have. And Scripture teaches us the best way to love God with everything we have is to love the people that God has put in our lives, the people that are around us. To love them. Let's not lose our way. Let's not lose our power and our purpose. Amen. Rob, we thank you for that lesson. We'll now have our closing song before our prayer today. It is In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Found through the fiercest drought of storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. That's a song you can carry with you all week, isn't it? We thank you so much for joining us here this morning. We wish you a blessed Sunday and a blessed week. Good morning. Um, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for letting us have friends, family to call to keep us company. Please make sure all of the people we know and everyone we don't know, keep them healthy. Thank you for just putting a roof over our heads and thank you for making sure we're all safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.